Okay, we're going to continue with our study on the prophet Elijah. We're going to get back to him. We took a week off, but uh, we'll get back to him. And we're, we're going to pick this up where we left off last week, which is over in 1 Kings chapter 18. Um, Got to find the verse. Verse 36, 1 Kings 18, 36. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I, thy ser I am thy servant and have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God and that thou hast turned their heart back again. Now, last time we talked some about, about the effectual, fervent prayer of Elijah uh, and how it was, some of, the, some of the things that were involved in that prayer and, and why it got through. And I want to I continue on that because we, we didn't cover everything. And I want to really nail this down because this is important. This is how your prayers get through. And so if you've ever run into one of these times where it just hits the ceiling and bounces back and lands on the floor in front of you and you know you're not getting attention, I want you to know how you, how your, what it takes to get your prayers to be like Elijah's so that they're answered the way that Elijah's prayers were answered. Um, I keep referring to Pink and I'm going to read some of his things again today because he was so much more eloquent than I could ever be. It's not that he says anything different here, it's just he says it better. He's prettier at it, you know. Um, in examining the prayer of Elijah on Mount Carmel, we have seen that first, at the time of the evening sacrifice, the prophet came near. That is, unto the altar on which the slain bullock lay. Came near as though expecting an answer by fire. There we behold his holy confidence in God and are shown the foundation on which his confidence rested, namely an atoning sacrifice. Second, we have heard him addressing Jehovah as the covenant God of his people, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel. He wasn't just praying to anybody, he was praying to a covenant God. Third, we have pondered his first petition. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. That is, that he would vindicate his honor and glorify his own great name. The heart of the prophet was filled with a burning zeal for the living God, and he could not endure the sight of the land being filled with idolatry. Fourth, and that I am thy servant, whose will is entirely surrendered to thee whose interests are wholly subordinated to thine. Own me as such by a display of thy mighty power. These are some of the things that are necessary when we pray to God, if we want God to answer our prayers. They're, they're the, the elements that meet with a response from God first, there has to be an actual drawing near to God. You have to draw near to God if you want him to answer your prayers. If it's just merely a something that you do out of courtesy. If you're not truly drawing near to him, don't expect an answer. And by that, there has to be a putting away of those things 
that offend God. You have to put that away. It's sin that alienates the heart between man and God. And it's sin that keeps the conscience of the guilty party at a distance to him. And it's sin that must be repented of and confessed if you want God to answer your prayers. If we want to access those temporal benefits from, that we get from our salvation, we have to put our sin away. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, there's a passage that we read. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's no promise that He will cleanse us from all unrighteousness if we don't confess and repent of our sins. Now, we're not talking about sin, sin, the sin nature that we inherit. That was taken care of on the cross. We're talking about the sins that we commit in this life. Christ did not die to purchase for His people an indulgence for them to live however they wish to and sin whenever and however they want. Now you might hear that in a lot of churches today, but that's not what Christ did. He shed his precious blood to redeem them from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We read that in Titus chapter 2 and verse 14. And to the degree that they neglect those good works, they will fail to enter into the benefits of his redemption in this life in a temporal sense. If you're a child of God, your eternal salvation is secure. But if you wish to have God's grace and benefits in this life, you must live according to the light that you have. And that includes repenting from and confessing all manner of sins that offend the Almighty. Turn to John chapter 15 and verse 7. John 15 and verse 7. Jesus says, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you. That's not just a blanket, anything you ask for you get, as you hear out of so many pulpits today. No, this is, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask and receive. Look also at 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22. 1 John chapter 3 and verse 22 where it says, And whatsoever we ask we receive of him, why? Because we keep His commandments and do those things that are pleasing in His sight. It's also important in drawing near that we realize and that we acknowledge the relationship that we have with Him. It's the blessed privilege of the believer, no matter how great a failure he may feel he is at the moment, to remind himself that he's approaching a God that he has a covenant relationship with. And to plead that covenant with him. King David, despite all of his failures, especially you consider the horrible sin with Bathsheba, the fact that he murdered Bathsheba's husband to try to cover it up, even despite all of that, he still had a covenant relationship with God. And he pleaded that covenant relationship over in 2 Samuel. You don't need to turn to this, it's a minor point. But 2 Samuel 23, 5, it says, He hath made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things and sure. 
It makes a world of difference when you approach God knowing that God is your Father and you have that relationship with Him. Just like if you plead to your earthly father, it will make a, a lot bigger difference than if he's someone that's estranged to you. And Jer turn to Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse 40. Here we have the promise of the new covenant. Jeremiah 32, I'm sorry, yeah, 32 and verse 40. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I, I, just for a second, that word everlasting, ever look that up in a dictionary? You ever look that word up in the dictionary? It means lasting forever. Kind of sounds like it would mean that, doesn't it? Everlasting, lasting forever. It kind of sounds normal. Infinite in future duration, endless. How many churches are there out there today that preach that you can be saved today and lost tomorrow? And they use John 3.16 as their proof text. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Well, if it's everlasting, how can it end? It can't. See, they're not preaching everlasting life. They're preaching temporal life. You can get it for a while as long as, you're, as, long as you keep working at it. Maybe you can hang on to it. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that if you're a child of God, you have everlasting life. You will never die. Your body might die in this world, but instantaneously you'll be in the arms of God. You have everlasting life, not something that just lasts for a while. But back to our text. Sorry about the rabbit. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. Yea, I will rejoice over them to do them good, and I will plant them in this land assuredly with my whole heart and with my whole soul. You see, this is the covenant. This is the covenant arrangement sh that we have with God. Look also at Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You see, that's the relationship that we have that we can plead if you are a child of God, you can plead that relationship with God. But you have to draw near to Him. You have to make sure your life is as clean as it can be if you want the answer from God. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 13. If we believe not... Yet he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. I've taught in this series that there are two things that God cannot do. Cannot do. One of them is he cannot lie. And another one is he cannot deny himself. Now I want you to look at that verse. It's striking how that man's lack of faith is contrasted with God's faithfulness, isn't it? Even if you don't believe, that doesn't change the fact that God's faithful. He cannot deny himself. Whether you believe or not, he cannot deny himself. If he chose you from before the foundation of the world, as we're told in Ephesians, if he wrote your name in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, which we're told in the book of Revelation, and he then sent his Son into the world to die and pay for your sins, which he did on the cross, then he can't deny that. He cannot deny that relationship. You are one of his children. God cannot deny himself. He does not sit up there with a bottle of whiteout and white your names out every time you do something bad. 
but he will turn his back and not hear you if you fall into sin and don't repent of it. But he will not deny the relationship. You have the covenant relationship with him if you are a child of God. Don't ever believe a religion that limits God's ability or power to save his elect. Because a religion that teaches that is the same religion that was taught in the Garden of Eden by the serpent. That's not God's religion. If you are one of God's elect, your eternal salvation is secure. But let's deal with what we have to deal with down here. And if you want answers to prayer from God, you've got to draw near to him, as Elijah did. And there's another thing that's essential. And this is where so many prayers fail. I want you to turn over to the book of James. After Peter, just before, or I'm sorry, after Hebrews, just before Peter. James chapter 4 and verse 3. Where James says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Now this was clearly not the case in Elijah's prayer. His only interest was in glorifying the living God. That's what he was concerned with. He wanted the fire to come down to glorify God. He wanted God to be able to be vindicated on that mountain that night. He wasn't interested in anything for Elijah's personal benefit. He was interested only in the glory of God. Look at 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. This is an important point. If you want to know what it takes to get prayers through, that's what we're going to talk about. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So the question is, how do we know if we're asking for something that's according to God's will? Well, here's the answer. When we make a request of God that will bring honor and praise to Him, it is always according to His will, and He will answer in the affirmative. That's what Elijah was doing. He was asking for God to do something that would bring honor and glory to God and God responded immediately. If you are asking prayers that will bring honor and glory to God, He will answer in the affirmative immediately. And finally, if our prayers are to be acceptable, they have to be one that's truly a servant of God. This is an important point. We read back here in 1 Kings 18.36, it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant. The servant is one that is submissive to the authority of, a, of another. Are you submissive to the authority of God? Search your lives and ask yourself the question, are you submissive to what he wants? To his will? Do you put his will first? One who takes the subordinate place, one who's waiting on the orders of his master, one who has no will of his own, one whose constant aim is to please his master and promote his master's interests. If you are a servant of God, he will respond to you. Is this not the exact manner which Christ gave us an example to follow? I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 2. When Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, Philippians chapter 2, and verse 5. Paul says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Here, the Lord Jesus Christ, God Almighty himself, who had the claim to everything that you behold, 
who was the creator of everything you see. It wasn't robbery for him to be considered equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of, men, likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And Paul tells us that we should have that mind in us as well. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. This man that was God manifest in the flesh became a servant for you. Are you a servant for God? Do you, look to, do you look to do what God wants more than what you want? Do you look for what, he's, what his desire is rather than your own? If you do, then your prayers will get through. But if you're asking for something just for yourself, it doesn't meet the test. Look at Romans chapter 1 and verse 1. Romans 1 and verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. That word servant, it comes from the Greek word uh, doulos, which actually means a bond slave. Now the way the bond slave deal worked was if you were, you could, in the Old Testament, in, in, in the olden days, you could sell yourself into slavery. If you got into debt, you could sell yourself into slavery and work for a certain number of years and pay off the debt and, and then be a free man. And there were some people that, that after they had served their term and were then free, um, they liked their master. They liked what they had going better than be, being free, so they became what were known as douloses, bond slaves. And they would then pierce their ear. They'd put one of those things in their ear. You see these guys nowadays that have those big rings in their ear? Well, that's you would have that and that would show the world that you were a bond slave that you were a bond slave to your master that your master was so good that you would prefer to go ahead and work for him than be on your own that's what a doulos was and that's what paul was with christ he was a bond slave he, he called himself a bond slave um, but he was a servant and these are the people whose prayers get through folks if we maintain our servant character when we approach under the throne of grace, we'll be preserved from the blatant irreverence which characterizes so much of professing Christendom today. You, you listen to these people that demand of God, that think that they can go to the Almighty and demand that He do something. That is not going to get through, not to the God of Heaven. Even if they are his children, that one won't get through, folks. In approaching God, we should never make demands or speak to, them, to him as though he, we think that he's our equal. We should rather approach him in awe and as a servant issue our petitions. And what are the main petitions that come from a servant? What are the things that a servant asks for, usually from his master? at least an obedient servant, the knowledge of what the master requires and the supplies to get the job done. That's what a servant asks for. And that's what we should ask for. What do you want me to do? And will you provide what's necessary to get it done? And those prayers will be answered if we remember this, our prayers will be answered in the affirmative a lot more often than not. And always more than if we look to try to glorify ourselves. Remember, Elijah said, and I have done all these things at thy word. Elijah was doing what God had told him to do. His prayer was answered. So back to 1 Kings 18.36, and it came to pass... 
at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and that I am thy servant, and that I have done all these things at thy word. This was advanced by the prophet as an additional plea that God would send down fire from heaven in answer to his supplication as an attestation of his fidelity to his master's will. This was the sign that I was doing what you told me to do. It was in response to divine orders that the prophet had restrained the rain. You remember that way, way back about 15 weeks ago? He'd suggested an open trial or a contest between him and the prophets of Baal. And by this visible sign from heaven, it might be known who was the true God. This was the test to find out who the true God was. And all this he had done, not of himself, but by the direction from above. And it adds great force to our petitions. If we are able to plead before God our faithfulness to his commands. David said in Psalm 119, verse 22, Remove from me reproach and contempt, for I have kept thy testimonies. Can you plead that? Can you plead that you, you have kept his testimonies to the best of your ability? That's what David said. And that carries great weight if you're able to say it. In Psalm 119, 31, I have stuck unto thy testimonies, O Lord, put me not to shame. The man that can say that he's kept the commandments and kept the testimonies of God is one who God will listen to if he can say it from the heart truthfully. Remember, for a servant to act without a direct order from his master is tantamount to self-will and presumption. And you don't want to fall into that. Remember Elijah over at the, when he was at the brook, Kareth, while he was watching the water run, run dry? He didn't move. He waited for orders from above. He didn't go talk to Ahab until God told him to talk to Ahab. He did what God told him to do and nothing more and nothing less. And that's what he commands of us. And God's commands are not grievous, at least those to whose wills are, are surrendered to him. David wrote in Psalm 19:11, the Lord has declared them that honor me, I will honor. And that's true. Those that honor God receive honor from God. And in 1 Samuel 2:30, he that is faithful in, um, I'm sorry, he, wrote, he said that in 1 Samuel 2:30. Um, and the way to honor God, if you want to know how to, how to honor God, this is the way. Walk in his precepts. Do what he tells you to do. Live to his word, to the best of your ability, the light that you have. That's how you honor God. When the servant of God has the testimony of a good conscience and the witness of the Spirit that he's acting according to the divine will, he may rightly feel himself to be invincible. I don't know about you, but there are times when you are truly walking with God that you feel like Superman. Nothing can touch you. And you know nothing can touch you. And that's the strength that Elijah had in what he was doing. here. Remember where he is. Remember what he's doing. He's facing the entire nation of Israel with this. This isn't just done in a corner somewhere. This is an open trial. That takes strength to do something like this. Where does that come from? knowing that he had been obedient to God and knowing that God would answer and not leave him confused or f looking foolish. God's word shall not return unto him void. His purpose shall be accomplished through heaven and earth, though heaven and earth pass away. And this too was what filled Elijah with calm assurance in that crucial hour. God would not mock him that had been true to him. 
So he said in 1 Kings 18, 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord. Does this not sound like the fervent supplications of a righteous man? Remember we're told over in James chapter 5 and 16, he said that the, the, prayer of a, the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And he was referring to Elijah in that passage. Do you, can you not feel the zeal of Elijah here? Hear me, O Lord, hear me. As he pours out his burden that the Almighty would stand vindicated on that day. It's the cry of the burdened heart that reaches to God. Is it any wonder that James referred to, to Elijah when, when he made that statement that the fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much? 1 Kings 18, 37, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. The lives of God's true servants have always been considered less important to themselves than that God be glorified in their actions, in whatever it is that they do. And that's what dominated Elijah's heart, that God be glorified and magnified and vindicated against the false teachings of the prophets of Baal. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 21. Just to make this point. This is something that God's servants have always dealt with. Acts chapter 21 verse 13. The Apostle Paul, when he was getting ready to go to Jerusalem, he said, then Paul answered, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Are you ready to die for the Lord Jesus? If the day comes when they put the gun to your head and say, Renou say renounce Christ or die, are you ready to take the bullet? Are you willing to take the bullet? Have you experienced enough of God's goodness to believe that he's on the other side? Paul would do it. Elijah would do it. I'm going to read, this is a long reading, but, it's in, but I think it's important that you hear this. And if you do not in your library have a copy of Fox's Book of Martyrs, you need to get it. And you need to read it. You need to see there's count after count after count of what your religious ancestors went through so you can be sitting in this room here today listening to the gospel. It was unbelievable what these people went through for centuries, how they were persecuted. We haven't been persecuted at all compared to these. This is during the times of Mar Marcus Aurelius. It says, Marcus Aurelius followed about the year of our Lord 161, a man of nature more stern and severe and, although in, and, also, and although in study of philosophy and in civil government no less commendable, yet towards the Christians, sharp and fierce by whom was moved the fourth persecution. The cruelties used in this persecution were such that many of the spectators shuddered with horror at the sight and were astonished at the intrepidity of the sufferers. Some of the martyrs were obliged to pass with their already wounded feet over thorns, nails, sharp shells, etc. upon their points. Others were scourged until their sinews and veins lay bare. And after suffering the most excruciating tortures that could be devised, they were destroyed by the most terrible deaths. Polycarp. I don't know, have you ever heard of Polycarp? Polycarp studied under the Apostle John. He knew the Apostle John. The Apostle John was his father in the ministry. <coughs> Polycarp, the venerable bishop of Smyrna, <coughs> excuse me, hearing that persons were seeking for him, escaped, but was discovered by a child after feasting the guards who apprehended him, he fed the guards. He was arrested and he prepared food for the guards that apprehended him. After feasting the guards, 
who apprehended him, he desired an hour in prayer, which being allowed, he prayed with such fervency that his guards repented that they'd been instrumental in taking him. He was, however, carried before the proconsul, condemned and burnt in the marketplace. The proconsul then urged him, saying, Swear, and I will release thee, reproach Christ. Polycarp answered, Eighty and six years have I served him, and he never once wronged me. How then shall I blaspheme my king, who has saved me? <clears throat> At the stake to which he was only tied, but not nailed, as was usual, as he assured them that he should stand immovable. The flames on their kindling, the faggots encircled his body like an arch without touching him. And the executioner, on seeing this, was ordered to pierce him with a sword. When so great a quantity of blood flowed out as extinguished the fire, but his body, at, his, at the instigation of the enemies of the gospel, especially Jews, was ordered to be consumed in the pile and the request of his friends who wished to give it Christian burial rejected. They nevertheless collected his bones and as much of his remains as possible and caused them to be decently interred. This is what one after another after another after another of your religious ancestors went through so that you could have the gospel, so that you could be meeting in a church. This is something that God's true servants have always been willing to do to be willing to die the most horrendous death, many of them singing hymns until their voices were extinguished in the flames. The point being, what they were doing was glorifying God. They were giving glory to God. Jesus said in John 17, 1, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify thy Son, that thy Son also may glorify thee. Even Christ himself was here to glorify the Father. When the glory of God is the motive behind our petitions, it is certain of an answer. As it was on that day in Mount Carmel with Elijah, Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and Thou hast turned their heart back again. Back from wandering after the forbidden objects to the God of heaven, back from Baal to the service and worship of the true and living God. Next to the glory of God was Elijah's hope for the temporal salvation of God's people. And this is the thing that drives a true minister of the gospel to this day. First and foremost, the glory of the Almighty, and second, the salvation of His people. Their eternal salvation was guaranteed for them when God wrote their names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. Preacher doesn't have anything to do with that. Preacher wasn't here then. It was secured for them when Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead after three days and three nights. And the preacher didn't have anything to do with that either. It was applied to them in the new birth by the Holy Spirit, and the preacher didn't have anything to do with that. The only thing the preacher has anything to do with is teaching them how they were saved eternally and showing them how to enter into fellowship with God in this life. And second to the glory of God, the thing that drives the minister is bringing God's elect children into this understanding and this salvation in this life. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, the Apostle Paul puts it this way. 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the preaching of the cross, I've got the wrong verse. How about that? I actually... I've been told I write down the wrong verses from time to time. I actually caught one this time. I wrote down the wrong verse. Turn to Luke chapter 15. We'll now I'm going to have to buy Wendy lunch. Luke chapter 15, verse 4.
Jesus says, What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost, until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. That's what we do as ministers. If you have ever in your life wondered what makes a guy like Conrad Jarrell or Ben Mott or Tim Boffey or Chad Wagner or me tick, if you've ever wondered what makes us tick, that's it. Number one, to bring glory to God and number two, to go find his lost sheep and teach him how to come into fellowship with God. That's what makes, that's what makes the world go round for us. That maybe that's why we're such weird and quirky people. But that's, that's what makes us tick. And that's what made Elijah tick us all as well. Turn to Acts chapter 20, verse The Apostle Paul speaking says, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit under Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's what drives the minister. Now there's one other thing I want to mention about this prayer, there's probably a couple of things, but one other thing that I want to mention about the prayer is that you notice that the prayer was fairly short. It wasn't that long. The prayer of Elijah was not very long, and if you look throughout the scripture, you'll find that most of the prayers that got through are very, very short and very to the point. In Ecclesiastes 5.2, Solomon said, Be not rash with thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. God knows what it is that you need. God knows what it is that you want. Let your words be few, be direct. In that prayer that Elijah said, there were only 63 words in the English language and there were less than that in the Hebrew. And yet, Christ referred to the Pharisees during his day as those in Mark 12:40 that devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. For a pre in, in other words, to show people standing by just how holy and pious they are. And that's what those prayers are designed to do. They're not designed to get to God, they're designed for people. Don't do that. Christ says go into your closet and close the door so people don't even know what you're doing and ask God what you want. And here's the result of that. It's found in 1 Kings 18.38. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. First, this remarkable incident should encourage weak Christians to put their trust in God. To go forth in his strength to meet the greatest dangers, to face the fiercest enemies, and to undertake the most arduous and hazardous tax, tasks to which he may call them. If our confidence be fully placed in the Lord himself, he will not fail us. He will stand by us, though no others do. He will deliver us out of the hands of those that seek our hurt. He will put to confusion those who set themselves against us, and he will honor us in the sight of those who have slandered or reproached us. Look not on the frowning faces of worldlings, but fix the eye of faith upon him who has all power in heaven and in earth. 
be not discouraged because you meet with so few that are like-minded but console yourself with the grand fact that if God be for us it matters not who be against us and more of God's children and especially as ministers need to come to the realization of this very simple truth though preaching the truth may not make one popular and they might only have a small church to attend or to preach to they should never compromise the truth for the sake of numbers or income or security or anything outside of the glory of the Almighty from time to time it's good good to go back and reread the Apostle Paul and adopt his attitude um, turn to 2nd Timothy chapter 4 even though everyone turned away from him at the end after standing before Nero the first time that man that the, this is Nero was the man that ultimately put the Apostle Paul to death after standing before him the first time this is what he wrote to the young preacher Timothy I doubt that many modern preachers like Rick Warren or Joel Olstein would write something like this at my first answer no man stood with me but all men forsook me the man that wrote the majority of your New Testament stood before Nero completely alone everyone else had left him he was there completely by himself he had been forsaken by everyone and look what he says I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that the, all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom to whom be glory forever and ever amen and the Lord has not changed now I mentioned the idea of being a servant earlier in this that if you're a servant your prayers get through granted the Apostle Paul was an apostle and granted you may not be an ordained minister but you're still a servant to God and you should still look to Paul as your he's your example are you willing to stand there completely by yourself and hold on to the doctrine you should be you should be willing to do it regardless of what comes because notice what he says notwithstanding the Lord stood with me Hebrews chapter 13 Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 let your conversation be without covetousness that conversation means manner of life the way you live your life and be content with such things as you have for he hath said I will never leave thee nor forsake thee so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me remember them that have the rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God whose faith follow considering the end of their conversation considering the end of their conversation Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever the God that Elijah prayed to is still the same God that we pray to today the God that answered Elijah is still the same God that answers prayer today look to the pattern of Elijah look to the pattern of the Apostle Paul look to the pattern of these of the Saints in the Bible and you will see what gets through 
and you'll see what doesn't. Put yourself unreservedly in his hands and seek only his glory and he won't fail, he won't fail you. Let me call one last thing to your attention regarding Elijah's prayer because this is of utmost importance if we wish, wish to reach the ear of the Almighty. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Over in Matthew chapter 9, there's a time when a couple of blind men were following Jesus. And in verse 27, it says, And when Jesus departed, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come into the house, the blind men came to him, and Jesus saith unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that thou not, um, that thou, that, that no man know it. You see, these two blind men had faith. They asked, they asked in faith. They asked believing that what they were asking they would receive. And they believed it and they got it. There was another time over in Mark chapter 9 when a, 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 a man came to Christ for, you know, on behalf of his son who was possessed with the devil. Mark 9 and verse 23. And he wanted Jesus to, 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 uh, to heal this child that was possessed, or to exercise this child that was possessed. In verse 23 it says, Jesus said unto them, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's how we should approach God. I believe. Help my unbelief. There are times when every one of us are going to lose faith. Every single one of us from time to time are going to stump our toes and lose faith. Pray to God, I believe. Help my unbelief. And in verse 24 it says, And straightway the father of the child, oh, I'm sorry, I just read that. This prayer should be constantly upon our lips. In 2 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 25 it says, And now, O Lord God, the word that thou hast spoken concerning thy servant and concerning his house, establish it forever, and do as thou hast said. You see, the other thing that Elijah was dealing with was he was doing nothing more than what God had told him to do. And he was able to appeal to that. If you are doing what God tells you to do, you can pray to him and he will answer, obviously. But you say, what is it to pray in faith? It's for the mind to be regulated, the heart to be affected by what God has said to us. It's laying hold of his word and then counting upon him to fulfill his, the promises that he's made to us. It's what Elijah had done. It's plain from his statement, I've done all these things at thy word. God had told him what to do. He did what he told him to do. He asked for God to bring the fire down. God brought the fire down. Some of the things that appeared utterly contrary to reason, things that the carnal mind would argue against, things that Elijah had to take in faith throughout the course of this study so far. The idea of seeking out the man that had sought his life and then ordering him to convene the entire nation of Israel at Mount Carmel seems outside of the bounds of carnal reason, does it not? 
If you're being hunted by someone, are you going to go present yourself to them? But Elijah did it in faith because God told him to do it. Living by a cave and expecting birds to bring you food and live off of the, bird, the food that the bird that ravens bring to you, the carnal mind says that's unreasonable. But Elijah believed it would work and he went. Going to live with a widow woman that only had enough food to last for one meal and stay there for years because the barrel never wasted and the oil never failed seems outside of what carnal reason would say for us to do. But he had faith. Many of the things that we look at seem outside of what carnal reason tells us would work. We have to act in faith. And remember again that this is written for our learning and for our encouragement. The Lord God is the same today as he was then. He's ready to show himself strong on the behalf of those that walk as Elijah and trust him. But you've got to be willing to trust him. So when you're faced with some difficult situation, some pressing emergency, some sore trial, don't place that trial or situation between you and God. Place God between you and the trial and trust Him. Meditate afresh on His wondrous perfections and infinite sufficiency. Ponder His precious promises which exactly suit your case and beg the Holy Spirit to strengthen your faith and call it into action. In all that we do, we must have a single eye to God's glory. With faith in fervent prayer, and then God will answer. 1 Kings 18.38 Here's the answer. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord, He is the God, and that Lord is all capital letters. That's Jehovah. The Lord Jehovah, He is the God, not Baal. This was the test, remember? Whichever brings down fire from heaven, He is the God. As we've already pointed out, this was not only exceedingly blessed, but it's also unspeakably solemn. And this is more evident when we call to remembrance those awful words that the Apostle Paul wrote in the letter to the Hebrews, in Hebrews cha chapter 12 and verse 29, where it says, For our God is a consuming fire. How rarely today is that text quoted? And even more rarely preached. Modern day preachers are full of sermons on how God is love, but they maintain a guilty silence upon the equality of the fact that he's also a consuming fire. God is ineffably holy, inexorably righteous, and therefore he must punish sin. He capital must punish sin. Hebrews chapter 2 verses 2 and 3 <coughs> Paul says, for if the word spoken by angels was steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? The angels fell and there's no salvation for them. The angels that took the side of Satan fell and will be in hell, and there's no salvation for them.
Proverbs 14.9 begins by saying that fools make a mock at sin. And people today make a mock at sin. And they don't think it's anything important. But one of the things that this proves, that this that what we're studying proves is that they will discover that you cannot mock God with impunity. He's long suffering, but there will come a day. They may defy his authority. They may trample upon his laws in this life. But, the, but in the next life, they will probably curse themselves for their madness. In this world, God deals mercifully and patiently with his enemies. But in the world to come, they will find out to their internal doing that he is a consuming fire. Pink said, oh, what a wondrous and marvelous sense is presented to us here on Mount Carmel. A holy God must deal with all sin by the fire of his judgment. And here was a guilty nation steeped in evil which God must judge. Must then the fire of the Lord fall immediately upon and consume that disobedient and guilty people? Was no escape possible? Yea, blessed by God it was. An innocent victim was provided. A sacrifice to represent that sin-laden nation. On it the fire fell, consuming it and the people were spared. What a marvelous foreshadowing was this, was that of what took place almost a thousand year la years later upon another mount, even Calvary. There the Lamb of God substituted himself in the place of his guilty people, bearing their sins in his own body on the tree. There the Lord Jesus Christ suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring them to God. There he was made a curse that eternal blessing might be their portion. There the fire of the Lord fell upon his sacred head. And we read in 1 Kings 18.39, And when the, all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God, he is the God. These people could no longer halt between two opinions. It was pretty plain who, the God, who God was. They'd seen it with their own very eyes. This was not a trick. They knew it wasn't magic. They knew it was truly fire from heaven that consumed the sacrifices and the wood and the altar and the stones and the ground. It was unmistakable that this truly happened and they saw it. So they cried the Lord Jehovah he is the God. So the controversy, at least for now, was settled. The controversy between Jehovah and Baal, it was settled. But just like their fathers in the wilderness, these children of Israel soon forgot what they'd seen, and they relapsed right back into idolatry. Awful displays of the divine judgment may terrify and they might convince the sinner to repent. But it only lasts so long as the impression is fresh. You see, something else is needed to change someone's heart. Seeing things happen will only last as long as the impression is fresh in your mind. I want you to remember that in the Old Testament age, these people did not have the Holy Spirit as we have it today. Many times we look back to them and we wonder, how in the world could you drift back into that after what you just saw? You picture the children of Israel as they come through the Red Sea on dry land, and it wasn't, but le it was less than two months later, and they're making a golden calf. You look at the time during Joshua, you re read the book of Joshua, when he when he gave that famous speech of, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and everybody was right behind him. And 
as soon as that generation passed away, they drifted right back into idolatry. You look at here the case of the fire coming down on Mark, Mount Carmel, and it wasn't but a couple of years, and they're right back into worship and Baal again. Why? Because they don't have, they didn't have the Holy Spirit like we have it. You think it's tough on us? It was tougher on them. This is what total depravity does to people. This is how far it really goes. Consider that. These people watched fire come down from heaven. And it was no time at all until they drifted right back into idolatry. Something else needs to change besides just witnessing something. You look at the miracles of Christ. All those miracles he did and yet many in the nation, they didn't believe They didn't believe him. How could you not believe him? He raised people from the dead. He made people see that had been blind from birth, and they, but they didn't believe him. You see, just because a preacher might throw a guilt trip on a bunch of people and get them to walk the aisle and get them to say the sinner's prayer, that, that's not what causes the new birth. God has to be involved in the new birth. It takes God to change somebody's heart. It takes God to change somebody's nature. It takes God to put his spirit within them. It has nothing to do with somebody standing up here in a pulpit and crying on people to come down the aisle. That's not how it works. If it's a new birth, it, God's involved in it. And if this doesn't prove it, what happened in Elijah, that just seeing miracles from God will change nature, then I don't know what will, because it didn't change theirs. 1 Kings 18.40 And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And he took them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon, and slew them there. I'm going to read I'm going to read something that Pink said here because it's it's interesting. You know a lot of people think that we're the only ones that have this idea about how God elected people from before the foundation of the world and 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 they would be surprised to hear that there's anybody else that might actually believe that. Well, here's something that Pink wrote regarding this passage. Very solemn is this. Elijah had not prayed for the false prophets. You really you go back and look at the prayer. He never prayed for those false prophets but for this people. And the sacrificed bullock availed not for them. So too with the atonement. Christ dies for his people, the Israel of God, and shed not his blood for reprobates and apostates. God has caused this blessed truth now almost universally denied to be illustrated in the types as well as expressed definitely in the doctrinal portions of his word. The paschal lamb was appointed for and gave shelter to the Hebrews, but none was provided for the Egyptians. And unless your name is written in the Lamb's book of life, there is not the slightest ray of hope for you. There are liberal theologians out there that take issue with Elijah's treatment of these false prophets of Baal. I wonder why. And they think that he shouldn't have killed them. That that wasn't a very Christian thing to do. However, I have to take issue with them for the following reasons. First, false prophets and false priests are the greatest enemies that a nation can have. For they bring both temporal and spiritual evils upon it. To permit those prophets of Baal and escape would have licensed them as the agents of apostasy and exposed Israel to further corruption.
It must be remembered that the nation of Israel was under the direct government of Jehovah, and to tolerate in their, those, in their midst those who seduced his people into idolatry was to harbor men who were guilty of high treason against the majesty in heaven. Only by their destruction could the insult to Jehovah be avenged and his holiness vindicated. And further, Elijah was under direct orders to carry out the commandments of the Almighty. Had he not already done so? Turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13, and we're going to believe, begin at verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them, Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall not walk after the Lord your God and fear you sh ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him, and that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he had spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in so shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee false prophets in the Old Testament were to be put to death. That's what Elijah did. Elijah did what God told him to do. Look also at Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy 18 and verse 20. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken, but the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, thou shalt not be afraid of him. How many times have we seen or heard of some TV preacher making some proclamation of when Christ is going to return and the day comes and the day goes and nothing happens. In the Old Testament, that's a false prophet and that man was to be put to death. Don't listen to people that hand you dates. None of them know. The whole blood moon thing, I mean, we're still here, right? The first of the blood moons came around Wednesday. The dogs woke me up at about 3.30 because they wanted to go out. And so I went out and I saw part of it. And it wasn't all that big of a deal, but I saw part of it. And we're still here. Once again, there were people out. There were people that were saying that this was going to be it. There's other people that are saying, well, no, no, we've got a couple of more. It'll happen next year. This time next year, it'll, it'll happen. Well, maybe it will and maybe it won't. But in the Old Testament, if you give a date of when Christ would, would it, uh, uh, you give a sign or a wonder and it doesn't come to pass, it's a false prophet. You only have to miss once. You only have to miss once. I remember years and years ago, I think it was Oral Roberts that was hid out on top of a tower somewhere at the university 
um, made some sort of prediction like this and never came to pass. And yet, people run to him. It'll be interesting. But I, I have a study that 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 we'll, that we'll get into as we continue with this study on Elijah that shows how 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 people just tend to run to that kind of stuff. It's amazing stuff. So Elijah was acting under the under the orders of God when he slew those prophets. Now we're, we'll pick this up again next week, Lord willing, and and. Uh, and there are some, there's a lot of interesting things that come out of this. The same, the same, I'll give you a little heads up, the same type of thing. When he then approaches Ahab, he could tell that Ahab was reprobate. He didn't tell Ahab to repent or to fall on his knees or to ask for this or that. He told him to go eat, as you'll see next week. Go eat your food. Um, but he was told to, sl to kill these, these prophets, and he did. Now, under the Christian dispensation, it's not our job to go kill false prophets. That's not what we do. We're told that, that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The application to us is this. We must unsparingly judge whatever is evil in our own lives. And we must make sure and shelter no rivals to God in our own hearts and let not one of them escape. If you find those difficulties, kill them because they are just as pernicious as these false prophets were. And so with that, I will close for this morning. Let's stand and be dismissed in prayer. And Lord willing, next week we'll continue with our, with our study and one of these days, we'll see some rain.